Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. There we go. That is it. How do you like my new intro? Uh, That is lovely. Uh, Thank you. Rayvon, Rayvon oh, for providing that to us. Dr. Gandhi's back. Uh, we we got interrupted by technical issues last time. She very kindly has agreed to come back for another few minutes. Uh, she, of course, is a vaccine optimist. She's the head of Division of HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine, where she is the Associate Division Chief, rather, uh, at UCSF San Francisco General Hospital. Also medical director of the HIV clinic at San Francisco General Hospital. And so uh, I recommend most highly that you follow Dr. Gandhi on Twitter at Monica Gandhi, G-A-N-D-H-I-9. And just so we can, so everyone can recall your your handle, is there a meaning behind the nine? No, it was just what was <laughs> not taken. <laughs> right. That's my email. It sounds there like that. There are actually nine vaccines have, that have been developed for COVID, though. Nine. Ooh, there we go. So we guys... colon activated ones and six that involve the spike protein. So, so that's it. So remember that. Um, <laughs> and I, I cannot for the life of me remember what we were into, but I was, I was, well, I'm sure I'm going to work back my way back into it because I remember I was getting into some stuff where I was like, really interested to know what your thoughts were. Um, Again, we'll follow Dr. Gandhi on Twitter. She is very reasonable. She is, I, I don't know how to get people to understand that um, do not, cons- if you consider yourself certain about anything, that's not biology or medicine. There's no right. certainty right. in biology. Right. And if things seem, if you're way on one end or way on the other, I mean, I'm glad those people are there. I want to listen to them and talk to them, but the probability of it being accurate is pretty low. Is that a reasonable way to think about things? I think that's very accurate. There's no such thing as certainty. Let's just remember what Thomas Kuhn said about science, that there actually never was a defined science. Everyone who is making recommendations right now are informed by their own personal bias. The scientist itself cannot be taken out of the equation. And so when we're hearing one person say boosters for everyone and one person saying not there are, there are biases in what people are saying. And we have to just look objectively as much as we can at the data. Yes, and just try and try to let it unfold. It, it's it's very hard to understand things. I, like, for instance, I today tweeted, I retweeted a study from Duke where uh, there was, I forget, 600 cases or something of, of illness. Um, the vast majority was in vaccinated individuals. No hospitalizations now. Right, no. Now, sp- they weren't ill. I mean, just to be very fair, like yeah. they do a really nasty symptomatic screening, and the word illness, as doctors, we have to reserve for being ill. And um, most of them were asymptomatic. Um, and you're right, no severe illness, no hospitalizations, with a 97 percent student do great. So yeah. why are we yeah. doing that much testing? Yeah. And, and again, I, we understand this. This is why I want to. I brought this up. Is we I understand that was a slice of time. And it was a population predominantly younger because they were students, included faculty and staff and things. There were some older folks in there. And, you know, it it just looked good. It was reassuring. And that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for is reassuring data. Reassuring. I mean, the Provincetown outbreak for me, you know, which was that what was published on July 30th from the CDC, everyone, there was so much mess around it and messaging around it like, oh, this means everyone's going to get some breakthroughs and you can spread Delta. What it told me was reassuring data that we had a huge number of people descending on a town. Lots of the windows were closed. It was inside. There was a lot of intimacy, lots of stuff going on. And the the amount of severe illness was so low. Right. And that that's where we are with vaccines. It's amazing. Right. And so when people express concerns about the vaccine, I, again, it's against what? Uh, I, you know, yes, nothing we do as physicians is 100% safe, including walking in our office. That's that we, yeah. Stuff happens. And we yeah. generally, our job is to assess the risk reward. And to, we, we do dangerous stuff in order to prevent worse stuff. So yes. we're no one's saying, oh, no, this doesn't have zero risk. We're saying the risk appears to be well worth it. So let me yes. let me bring up two things that swirl around vaccines, I guess. Are we on YouTube right now, Susan? Are we allowed to talk about vaccines? Yeah, I'm just telling everybody right now um, to head on over to the dark side okay. of Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, and Twitch because right, we, we're going to turn off our YouTube you channel. You can't talk about vaccine therapy. On, yeah, on I, don't, I don't want to get a all third right, strike. It right. has nothing to do with you guys being anything bad. No, it's I just, know. It's just this weird thing. But let, let's talk it's about a word. If, let's, if, before if, we go, let's talk about monoclonal antibodies. Okay. I, I'm, I am very excited that that seems to be 
finally on the upswing. Are, are you seeing what I'm seeing? That people are, I, I'm seeing physician when, when before I was out there saying, please go ask your doctor about this. And literally people would ask their physicians, their physician would go, I, I don't know what you're talking about, or I don't know how to get it. Now I'm seeing urgent care centers, doctor's offices, advertising. We have it. We want to give it. But states are putting together outreach programs. It's a complete turnaround. It seems to me. Am I right on that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we're talking about, when we talk about vaccine, I miss like one key word. Mon monoclonal <laughs> antibodies. Oh, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think that they are, they work really well. I think they work for treatment. They work for prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis. And we have had a turnaround where people think, I did not say, know that. Yes. But yeah. we need to use so, yes. so there was a, there was a lead article in the England Journal of Medicine that shows you can take it subcutaneously, I think for four days or five days and really yes. prevent transmission. I would like yes. to take it on my, I would like to take it. I would like to have it with me when I travel and, and yes. I, I yes. and I'm betting, I'm betting that they will start to use sub-Q therapeutically. Am I right about that? I think you're right about that because when we think about the power of monoclonal antibodies, rheumatologic illnesses, and also we've been studying them in HIV for a long time, that is the, the promise is that yeah. you can sub-Q give them. Right yeah. now, only two, and they're kind of hard to give, but that's what we want. That's what we want. Because they did that once. We need a way to treat, Mild. We need a way to treat mild disease and, and, no and prevent it or reduce the risk of progression yes uh and so when people all right, all right. We're, we're, we're sending everybody over the dark right, side now we've lost you two okay so right. wait 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 okay let me do it okay bye everybody <laughs> see you over there i see twitch going nuts so <laughs> we love you youtube but say goodbye to 100 people all right.